Let's open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Hebrews, chapter 13. This will be our last week in the book of Hebrews. Let's read the last nine verses of chapter 13. That'll be verses 17 through 25. Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. It's been about 14 months, maybe 15 months, since we began studying the book of Hebrews each week. I appreciate those of you who have been here every week, and I trust that you've learned something. I've learned more as we go along. They say, the best way to learn something is to teach it because it forces you to study a little harder in order to convey it to somebody else. The saints are told to obey their pastors and elders here in verse 17 and to salute them down in verse 24, which doesn't mean a military salute, not like that, but it means to greet with kind wishes and respect, according to Webster's 1828 dictionary. And it would also imply you're submitting to them in verse 17. And why do you do that? Because they watch for your souls as they that must give account, the text says. And a pastor wants to give account of his ministry with joy and not with grief, as it says here. If a pastor, and I mean by that a sincere Bible-believing man, sees you doing something or going to places that might not be a good image for a Christian, and certainly not some place you can imagine the Lord Jesus himself going or doing. It grieves the pastor. And uh, if his admonitions or his reproofs make you resentful, that grieves him. The idea that, what does he know? He should mind his own business. That grieves him as well because he watches for your soul. And it grieves him because that is unprofitable for you, verse 17. It's unprofitable for a child to not mind his dad or his mom, to not do what they tell him to do, because they know they're trying to shape his character and mold him into the kind of young man or young lady uh, that, that they won't have to be embarrassed about one day. And... Uh, God puts pastors in charge of congregations who come to them to help them teach the Word of God and to help teach the Word of God, rather, and help them to learn and grow as believers and to develop those things in them that would reflect well on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to be an embarrassment to the name of the Lord Jesus. And I don't think anyone here does either. I want God to look at me and say, I'm proud of what he's doing. He's serving well. He's not perfect, but none of my saints are. <laughs> but I don't want him to be ashamed of what I desire to do for his name. And uh, likewise, a pastor doesn't want his flock to be a disgrace to the cause of the Lord Jesus. The word pastor is an old Latin word. It means shepherd. 
And that's exactly what the, um, the title or the duty of a pastor is to be. Uh, notice what Paul writes back in first, keep your finger here, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians and chapter 4, notice verse 15. Paul writes there, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Nothing would please a pastor more than to see his own converts become good Bible students and soul-winning men and women in their own right one day. He writes, pray for us there in verse 18. Well, the us indicates Paul and his companions. We trust we have a good conscience. That's Paul's trademark expression. Go back, if you will, to the book of Romans, chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And notice there, verse 13. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Go forward to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians four and uh, verse two. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And also Second Corinthians chapter eight. Turn a page. Second Corinthians eight verse twenty one providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. That's a, a trademark expression Paul uses quite a bit, honesty and the conscience. He wants them to pray also that I may be restored to you the sooner, there in verse 19. And this has all the earmarks of Paul uh, being in jail, wanting to get out soon. And he wrote in Philippians 4, verses 21 and 22. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Unquote. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And in our text, look down at verses 24 and 25. Salute all them that have the rule over you. And all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. And now he says, um, now the God of peace, verse 20, the God of peace. Um, let me have you run back again to the book of Romans, chapter 16. Romans, chapter 16. And notice there, Verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And also run to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. It's clearly Paul writing what we're reading here. Um, back to our text. Our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Verse 20. Christ's blood was eternal. Also here in Hebrews, back at chapter 9, Hebrews 9, verse 14. Uh, 
How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Um, Matthew 26, verse 28. You don't need to turn. Matthew 26, verse 28 says, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The words testament and uh, covenant used interchangeably in these texts. Um, and it's agreement between two parties that certain things will go into effect after the death of one. And John 5, verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. And the second party in that covenant being you. You now have everlasting life and eternal life if you are trusting in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. The one who has everlasting life can't apostatize. He can't lose his salvation. The reason that has to be so is because if you could lose it, then it shouldn't be called everlasting life, should it? It should be called something else. Temporary, conditional, any other term. But it shouldn't be called everlasting. And the Hebrews he addressed earlier in chapters 3 and 6 and 10 could fall away. They could fall away because they had to endure to the end. Uh, here, uh, it's not a requirement for someone to remain saved or remain close to God or know that they're on their way to God's heaven or the kingdom of heaven because there's no condition attached. There's no requirement that you have to do so many things, give so much money away, join this organization, um, participate in these rituals, take any number of these ordinances or sacraments, whatever it's, whatever the stipulation is, in order to hope that maybe you're saved. This is the problem with other religions that spell out exactly what God wants you to do. These are the ordinances of our ordinances of our church. These are the sacraments of our church. These are the things that, through divine revelation, we believe God has instructed us to teach to our members. So you mean if I do all of those things? then I know that I'm saved. Well, no. I've read some of these books, some of these books by, uh, whether it's a Roman Catholic uh, apologist or I've talked to Mormons uh, in these kinds of conversations, and I said, so if you died right now, do you know for sure that you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? No, I don't believe anybody can know. That's up to God. I think I mentioned last week uh, this is called the sin of presumption by a lot of Catholic uh, bishops. How dare you say that you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? There's part of you already there waiting to, for this body to catch up with it. That's to presume things that um, no one knows. But the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Brother... Uh, Manuel and I were talking about this just a little while ago, that the Bible says you can know that you're saved now and that, that, that heaven is a, a sure guarantee. It's a done deal between you and the Heavenly Father. You don't have to wait and hope you pass the test once you die. You know, once you die and you didn't pass the test, it's a little late to make up for it then. That's why you've got to be sure of it now. Be sure of it now. People don't like that kind of certitude. They don't like that kind of certainty, that kind of absolute confidence. They like to keep it vague and sort of mysterious, sort of a guessing game. I think I'm on my way because I think I'm better than the next guy. That makes me more confident than he is. And there may be some Christians. No, I'm not. Let me take that back. Let me rephrase this. There are many Christians who are saved. Their name is in the... Lamb's Book of Life recorded in heaven. There's a mansion in heaven by Jesus Christ waiting for them, and they're living some of the most God-awful lives you could ever imagine. They are not yielded to the Holy Spirit. They're not reading their Bible. They're not praying. They're living only to satisfy their own flesh and the 
lusts of this life. And down deep inside, they're miserable. They really are. They know what they're doing is not pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. When he looks at them, they're the kind of Christian that God probably is embarrassed about. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's the story of where Paul admonishes the, the church in Corinth about a guy in their church who had his, mother, his father's wife. The Bible doesn't specify if it was his mother or his father's wife, a stepmother. But this man evidently was shacking up or fooling around with his mother. Let's say it that way. And um, they hadn't mourned. They hadn't grieved over it. It wasn't something that had bothered them. And Paul says that by the Holy Spirit and in his spirit, he tells him to turn such an one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of judgment. That is one of the best texts for eternal security you'll ever find in the Bible. It doesn't get much worse than a guy fooling around with his mother. And Paul says, pray that God kills that guy so he won't do any more damage. He won't be a bigger embarrassment than he already is. The flesh may die, but the spirit will be saved in the day of judgment. Boy, if it doesn't get much worse than that, then, and that guy kept his salvation, then um, you ought to have great confidence that if God's forgiven you and you have a assurance that you're saved, that you should never have to doubt it, you never wonder about it, never question it. Oh, you may wonder how God could keep loving you when you mess around and you mess up and make mistakes, and I wonder that, and I know I'm not alone in the world, how God can keep loving me when I'm less than the Christian I ought to be. And as I've said often, it'll be a catchphrase uh, recited at my funeral someday. He's been a sorry Christian many times, but he never was sorry that he was one. And that's how I feel. But um, once again, you can see the change in Paul's emphasis from the first 12 chapters, which we spent a great time in, and here in chapter 13, after he had seen and received re revelation of the body of Christ, joining Jew and Gentile together by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes, the God of peace, verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that matches Philippians 2.13. He says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The word of exhortation mentioned in this text, that's another pastoral function. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. It means to challenge the believer, to urge the Christian to continue and not to give up, not to be knocked down by the problems of life and fall by the wayside. Uh, and he claims that he wrote in few words, verse 22. The book of Hebrews has 13 chapters, 280 verses. It's fewer than the book of Romans, which has 16 chapters, fewer than 1 Corinthians, chapter, uh, which has 16 chapters. But it's certainly longer than 2 Corinthians, or Galatians, or Ephesians, or Philippians, or Colossians, or 1st or 2nd Thessalonians, or 1st or 2nd Timothy, or Titus, or Philemon. So what did Paul mean when he say he wrote in few words? I have no idea. And neither does anybody else. Someday maybe we'll figure out what he meant exactly when he said he wrote in few words. Certainly not few if you're sitting down starting to read your Bible. Nothing will put you to sleep better than starting to read the Bible. If you have insomnia, you can't sleep, start reading the Bible. I mean, all scripture is profitable, right? <laughs> you say that, you're making fun of the Bible. No, I'm using the Bible for practical benefit. Start reading some of those lists of genealogies. Start reading some of the list of all those names of people that came out of Babylon uh, under Ezra and Hezekiah and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Or try pronouncing some of those names. That'll wear you out. That's difficult as well. So 
But uh, some things we don't know exactly what what they mean, and I've and some Christians have never figured it out. What did Paul mean precisely? He said he wrote in few words. I don't know anyone that that can say. The modern Bibles don't improve it. They say in some versions I wrote a short letter. Well, it's not a short letter, or words which really don't help. They just make it even more obscure. And then he gives this familiar closing, verses 23 to 25. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. And uh, he mentions Timothy. By the fact of him mentioning Timothy, that's without a doubt the indication that Paul was the author, because Paul was sending Timothy and Titus and his younger disciples all over the place to check on the churches and the welfare of believers all over the uh, Mediterranean world at that time. So uh, if nothing else, that would indicate Paul as the definite author. Even though the King James translators put at the beginning of Hebrews, right before chapter 1, the, uh, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews, even though the text nowhere identifies Paul as the author. I think they had enough sense to see how much of this matches so many other elements of Paul's letters that they weren't afraid to put his name as part of the title. And I've learned a lot going through this book. The number of things that, um, like I say, if you want to learn it, set out and endeavor to teach it because it forces you to study uh, more diligently. God spoke to the Hebrews through the Apostle Paul telling them what Christ had done for them, uh, how the, de the death of the animals were insufficient. They got a man so far, but the death of Christ was what was necessary to replace the temporary salvation, or forgiveness rather, that came from the animals. And now they, he affected permanent salvation by his own death. But chapter 13 matches all of his other letters so closely, and it talks about the, uh, the benefits of the life of Christians, Jew or Gentile, knit together in, a one, in one body. So there must have been some revelation come to the Apostle Paul between the close of chapter 12 and when he finally added chapter 13. I think that's probably the best approach to understanding the book of Hebrews.